So let's go ahead and get started. Dr. Guerrero John is a uh, fourth year MedPeds uh, resident, and all of our graduating residents are required to do a grand round. And so he has chosen to talk about impactful medicine. So, our clone. Thank you. Good morning, guys. Good morning. All right. So, the title of my topic is Impactful Medicine. So um, I kind of came up with it, uh, you know, based on the residency. Uh, you know, we have all these clinical encounters and um, think about your, the time you spend in the patient's room with them, that's 15, 20 minutes. How can, create, how can you really make an impact as far as make that, make that money count? You know, the 20 minutes you spend with them, how, does it, how do you make it really count? So uh, don't have any disclosures. I ain't making no money from nobody. Um, these will be our learning objectives. So to discuss the various personal roadblocks of patients and families and how it might hinder their medical compliance. Number two is the key point, uh, demonstrate the ability to clearly identify a patient's personal motivation through new interview techniques. And then three, combine the first two learning objectives to create a more impactful encounter with our patients. So definition of impact. Have a strong effect on someone or something. So how do we have a really strong effect? So how do we define impact in medicine? So there's subjective ways we, we can feel like we're having a really good impact. Um, you know, patients tell us they love coming to see us. You know, you have good continuity of clinic. Your, your parents are like, oh, man, I love you, doctor, you know. Um, our peers and our mentors give us feedback. You know, our peers, you know, we meet with our advisors. We meet with our, um, our mentors, and they say, hey, you're doing a great job, or hey, you're doing a bad job. So you're not having an impact. So um, those are some subjective ways. Objective ways are uh, through our, um, so for instance, in diabetes, if our patient's blood sugars are well controlled, they have a good, they have a good A1C, that's an objective way. Hey, we're, we're having a good impact on our diabetic patient, or Asthma, so our, our kids are, they're symptom controlled. They're not having hospitalizations. We're having a good impact. You know, we're, we're keeping them out of the hospital. Um, obesity, so when our teenage kids and our adults, when they're, when they're losing weight, you know, because of the guidance we gave them, hey, we're having a really good impact there. So there's some objective ways we can quantify it. How I like to think about, um, am I really having an impact? So, you know, I may go over some diet tips. I may tell them, you can do this. Uh, I may eat scraps of medications, but I have truly inspired some change within the patient. So when they leave after our 20-minute encounter, do they feel like it was a lecture and are they going to go hit the gym? Are they going to go to get a fitness membership? Or are they going to run to McDonald's and supersize everything because they're tired of what I, everything I said? Um, so what, what happens after they leave, after they leave um, our clinical setting? So how meaningful was the 20 minutes we really spent together? Um, you know, if we make some changes today, I don't want to know what they're going to do tomorrow, but what are they going to be doing a month from now, two months from now? How far has that impact gone there? Um, they're going to come back. The next time when they come back, are they excited to come back to the, to the next encounter? Or they're dreading it and they just wish I'd, I just describe everything to them. Or they're really excited because they've seen some change. They want to show you the change that they've made. Uh, they're going to come back looking like this. Who knows? So um, the first thing is it's important to think about, like, what are we really asking of our patients? So, you know, whenever we um, think about when you were a kid and, you know, when your parents had to do, you told you to do chores, did you always do them on the first try? Never. My parents, you know, had to pull teeth to get me to do chores. And so, you know, every time you didn't do something, what if your parents were around saying, oh, man, my kid's not compliant. My kid's not compliant. My kid's not compliant. They're telling everyone he's not compliant because I didn't take the trash out. I'm telling everyone he's not compliant because I didn't do my homework. You know, think about it, even now in our mid-30s as professional doctors, we, you know, to, to do this grand round, Jessica had to email me three times, had to send me two forms and a text because I filled the form out wrong just to do this thing. She probably thinks we're the most non-compliant people in the hospital. So um, really, really try to understand what are we asking of our patients uh, when we we give them all these, all these guidelines that we're, we're following, all these medications, and all these tips that we think. Um, and so this is a word that I don't like, non-compliant. Uh, personally, I don't like the word because um, I feel like we, we use it pretty loosely. And we're like, oh, this patient's not compliant. They didn't do this, this, this. This parent's not compliant. They didn't do this, this, But we're not really truly understanding what, uh, what we're asking of them in the, the true daily setting. So let's go with the average day for me. So you know, I'm in my mid-30s. I'm seeing a lot of my kids. Um, I basically just come to work. I go to the gym. Do nothing. So average day for me. I wake up at 6, alarm goes off. I snooze it once. 6.10, I snooze it again. 6.15, I jump in the shower. Then 6.30, I pack my lunch, my big old lunch kit, y'all see. And then 6.40, I leave the house. 7, I go get checked out on the wards. 7.20, I get my coffee and breakfast. Pop a couple vitamins, you know, my morning meds. Uh, 7.30, uh, I run and see my patients. By 8, we head to morning report. 8.30, I go over some labs. By 9, I'm round, start rounding. I'm thinking about lunch already. Then by 10.30, I get back to the tea room. I scream at Deepu for a little bit. <laughs> you know, 11.15, I look at the discharges. I, I start screaming at Caleb for a little bit. 
By 11.45, I'm like wondering why we haven't gone to lunch yet. And 12, we run to the cafeteria real quick and show up to noon conference late. So this is average morning for, for one of us, OK? Um, let's think about the average, the average morning or average day for one of our 33-year-old patients. Has a couple kids. Maybe she's a single mom. Uh, she's, got a medical pro she's got some medical problems. All her kids have medical problems. Let's think about what her morning looks like. So 6 o'clock, you probably can't see this, but uh, she wakes up to a screaming child. So she goes and turns the TV on and throws them in front of the TV. 6.10, she runs and go take her morning Synthroid. She's got to take on an empty stomach. Uh, so she goes and pops her pill real quick. 6.20, she tries to quickly go take a shower before the other kids wake up. 6.40, she throws a 10-year-old in the shower. At 6.45, she starts making breakfast for, his, you know, starts making breakfast for the kids, makes lunches for them. By 6.50, she gives breakfast to the 10-year-old because the 10-year-old has diabetes. The 10-year-old's got to take, take her insulin. Throws a 5-year-old in the shower. At 7 o'clock, the 2-year-old wakes up. She's like, oh, crap, forgot to feed the 2-year-old baby. Let me feed him real quick. <laughs> At 7.15, she gives, she gives the five-year-old, he's got asthma, so she gives him, he gives him his palm court. Hurry up and take your palm court. 7.30, grandma wakes up, grandma, she's like, here, take the newborn, I gotta take the kids, the other kids to school. By 8.15, she's gotta get, she gotta get back from school, she gotta lay out grandma's 12 pills, grandma's got like a gazillion medical problems, grandma comes to our general medicine clinic, so. Uh, she gotta lay out all her pills for her. By 8.30, she hurry up, gets grandma in and out of the bathroom, gets her seated, turns on her TV, and then by 8.45, she's like, oops, I forgot to take her morning coffee. She's done all this stuff. She didn't have her morning coffee. How's she gonna get, how's she gonna function? By, and this is dramatization, by the way. So. <laughs> by 8:50, she runs out the door. She drops the two-year-olds at the sister's house because somebody's gotta watch the two-year-olds. 9:10, she shows up late to work. Her boss is already pissed. By 9:15, she realizes in a hurry she forgot to take her blood pressure meds and her diabetic meds because she was laying out grandma's pills. She was giving the other kids meds, and, you know. And she had to wait time for after her synthroid. By 9.30, she starts to feel lightheaded. She's kind of like, somebody's got to be a blood pressure cuff. She checks blood pressure. It's a little elevated, but she's like, whatever. We got to work. Somebody's got to pay the bills. By 10, she's getting yelled at for her boss because she's, she's working slow. She showed up late. 10.30, the school calls her. She's like, oh my God, your kid's blood pressure, your blood, blood sugar is low. You forgot to send the snacks. Said he's supposed to take all his snacks. So the snacks didn't show up. She's like, oh my God, what do I do? 10, at 10.45, she realized that she didn't even eat breakfast. She, never, she barely had a coffee. And she didn't take her meds. By 11, you get a call from the school, the, the other five-year-old's wheezing. She's like, oh my God, what do I do? 11.15, she leaves work. She's like, boss, don't fire me, please, don't fire me. By 11.30, she calls, a, she calls the general medicine clinic. She's like, oh my God, guys, I have to cancel my appointment. Please, reschedule me. And she gets an appointment four months later. <laughs> so, so, what are we really asking of our patients? How does my morning and her morning co compare and contrast, Elliot? Are they pretty much similar, or are they very, 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 very different? Very, very different. So when we think about, we think about that 33-year-old mom, is she, you know, she shows up and her A1C is a little off, or her TSH is off. She's truly non-compliant. You know, her kid shows up, and her kid didn't get all her treatments. Or, you know, her, uh, when, uh, when her 10-year-old comes to the, to the clinic, we're like, oh, how's, how's your blood sugar been well controlled? Have you been having any dips or any, 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 uh, any peaks in your blood sugars? You know, are they truly, truly non-compliant? No, because we're not truly understanding what we're asking our patients. You know, me as a 33-year-old guy, when I, when I spit out all these things, I think about, oh, man, if I tell them to do this, they can do it because I think about what my day is like. But we're always giving instructions to patients based on what we think our lives are like. And for the, for the most part, most of our lives, uh, you know, through residency and training are, are pretty, pretty mundane. Um, when we get into our 30s and when we get into our 40s and stuff, you know, when we have kids, maybe it'll be like that. Maybe we'll have a better understanding of, of our patients. But at this point, we... I know I personally don't have an, a great understanding of what I'm really asking my patients every single day when we bark out all these orders. And, and then when they, don't come, when they come back the next visit and they haven't done everything, we're like, oh, man, they're non-compliant. So are they truly non-compliant? I don't believe they are. So um, try to remove that word from your vocabulary. You know, I know we do have a lot of non-compliant patients. And, uh, but for the most part, whenever you're seeing your patients, try to get that word out and try to really understand what, what their barriers are. So what are some of our patients' barriers? Um, think about time. So it's only 24 hours in a day. Think about that mom's first, like, six hours in the morning, how much stuff she had to do. Think about how much stuff she has to do the rest of the day. Um, so time is a big barrier. Money, what can our patients afford? You know, most of our kids, yes, they're covered. You know, they have Medicaid and whatever we, whatever we prescribe them, really, um, whatever. You know, they, they get it covered, but for our adults, that's not the case. Um, this, this talk is more for not really our babies, but for our teenagers and, um, and our adult patients. So what can they really afford? When you, when, you, when you give them a whole list of five, six, seven medication, can they really afford that? Like every month, if I told you to go buy multivitamins and super B complex and vitamin E, and, and then you went to the store and it was like 70 bucks, would you really buy all of them? Uh, probably not. So what can they really afford? 
work and school? Like, does this get in the way of what we're asking to do? Uh, what we're asking them to do? Um, and then family. How many people are these people taking care of? For instance, a 33-year-old mom has three kids, a baby, a 5-year-old, a 10-year-old. She's got her mom. Uh, what are, what's their household situation? Like, what are they really doing every day? Um, and really think about our parents with the kids who have chronic illnesses. The kids have chronic illnesses, but the parents have, the parents have illnesses too. And so we need to be thinking about uh, how many people are they taking care of? Um, so time, money, how big, how big their families are. Um, some of the other barriers are literacy. Um, can our patients, you know, everything we tell our patients, they really understand, are we really speaking in layman's terms to them? Or we're just throwing out a bunch of words. They're kind of sitting there like this, like nodding their head. And they're like, oh, yeah, I'm feeding uh, three hours, uh, three ounces every three hours, like every mom repeats to you when they come in. And you know that they're not, they're just saying what they need to say. Uh, so there's literacy barriers. And then um, with literacy barriers comes our older patients. I had a patient uh, who for like months didn't, I, I, I didn't understand what, like why she was mixed, taking the meds wrong. And I realized she didn't have glasses. Uh, she broke her glasses while she was doing yard work and her reading glasses. She couldn't, she couldn't read the bottle. And so uh, but she ended up getting some glasses and all of a sudden everything got fixed. So, uh, but she was afraid to tell me she, she, she couldn't read anything. So, um, and then um, side effects, like all the medications. Like, so for instance, half our patients are on metformin. Everybody hates metformin because it gives them all diarrhea. Uh, everybody, they'll say they take it. They don't really take it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you ever, even if you, you guys, we get the, everybody gets the flu shot and they're like, oh my God, my arm hurts. Think about all these medications we're putting in our bodies. All these medications that are made, they're made in a, in a factory, and they're not natural for our body. So they're all going to have side effects. And anybody who's taking meds, you know, you know that sometimes it gives you nausea, it gives you vomiting. Think about our diabetic kids, all the pinpricks and uh, all, the, all the needles that they have to do. So think about the side effects, all the vomiting. OK, so we're going to do a little exercise. Uh, everybody close your eyes. I want you to think about what drives you, OK? I want you to think about. Um, how you feel about your personal health, and then think about one thing that you could do for yourself that's a positive health behavior, so something that you would want to do um, that you know would have a positive impact on your health. I want you to imagine yourself doing it. Imagine yourself getting like the benefits from it. Okay, you can open your eyes. Deepu, what was your positive health behavior? Going to the gym, good. Going to the gym and exercising is something we pretty much tell all our patients to do. Because um, pretty much everybody, nobody comes and looks like the guy in the middle. So, um, so let's talk about going to the gym. Deepu, uh, what might you enjoy about going to the gym? The feeling of accomplishment that you did something for yourself. Good, good, good. So he said the feeling of accomplishment, you did something good for yourself. Um, if you decided to go to the gym, how would you do it? Like say tomorrow, say today you want to go to the gym. How would you do? Get ready, pump myself up. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Tell Son, tell Sonia he's leaving early. Pump myself up. Pump yourself up. Get, get you know, hydrate myself. Hydrate get up. The gym, you know. Get to the gym. Good. Visualize yourself pumping iron. Visualize yourself pumping iron. Okay. He's thinking about it, but he he can see himself getting to the gym. Um, how important is it to you to go to the gym and work out? How important is it to you to go to the gym and work out? Not that important. Okay. That's okay. But it, it's, it's key. The key is that he's being honest. It's not, that, it's not super important to him. That's okay. Um, what, if any, are some important benefits that you would see if you did regularly go to the gym? Uh, I don't know. Not be as fat, I guess. Can I get more? Not be as fat anymore. That's okay. Those are real things. I mean, this is a, we all want that, right? So, uh, and then what are you already doing? Or is there any steps you're doing already to get yourself to go to the gym? Is there anything you're doing in process? Do you have a gym membership? I have a gym at my apartment complex. Yeah. There you go. So you're paying rent at a place that gives you access to a gym. So you are doing something towards it. Good. All right. So what we, what me and Deepu just interacted is called motivational interviewing. Um, this is going to be the crux of uh, today's presentation. So motivational interviewing is a collaborative, goal-oriented method of communication uh, with particular attention to the language and change, language of change. So think about change. Um, it's intended to strengthen personal motivation for and commitment to uh, a change goal by eliciting and exploring an individuals' own arguments for change. Okay. So just uh, focus on the word change for motivation entering. So when we think about motivation entering, we have to think about different helping styles. So 
there's direct helping style. Um, direct helping style is like, uh, say, a patient goes and she goes to Walgreens, she checks her blood pressure regularly. Uh, she realizes that it's higher than what she thinks it's supposed to be. So she makes an appointment, comes to the office, and she's like, uh, hey, doc, uh, my, I think my blood pressure is high. Um, I know it's not supposed to be high. I want to do something about it. Uh, let's do something about it. You prescribe her medication, and her blood pressure comes high. So that's a direct form of help. So she comes to you for help, and you direct her to the goal. Um, then there's a following helping style. So a following helping style is like, say, a teenager comes, in, comes into the clinic, and she's talking about uh, how she's getting bullied at school. Um, and so you provide her with some empathy. You haven't told her what she should do about it or whatever, but she's really just looking for some support. Um, and so you provide her with some empathy, and um, she feels a little better. So you're kind of you're following her towards the goal of, of, uh, of getting better. And then there's, um, there's guiding helping style. So guiding helping style it includes elements of both. Um, there is a destination that we want the patient to get to, uh, but you're not directing them. You're kind of going along with them, um, along the journey. Um, and an example would be like the, the patient with the blood pressure comes in, and instead of being like, hey, here's your medication. This will bring your blood pressure down. You say, hey, well, I have some medication I think could help if you'd like to try it. Um, so think of motivational interviewing as uh, a specialized guiding helping style where we interact in a manner so we get the patient to tap into their own experiences uh, to promote the healthy change. So remember, healthy change is what we want. But we get the patient to tap in versus us just telling them what to do. So how do we identify different helping styles? So let's do, let's do a little, well, I'm going to ask you some stuff. So, all right, diabetic patient comes into the office feeling dizzy. Blood glucose is in the office at 600. You tell him he needs to go to the ED immediately. Richie, what kind of helping style is that? Direct or following? Are you directing him to the goal or are you following him to the goal? Directing him to the goal, perfect. Um, patient's father got recently diagnosed with cancer, lung cancer. He comes in, he's like, oh, I got a 20 pack year smoking history. You're like, hey man, you should stop smoking. Uh, you're gonna get lung cancer too. What kind of style is that? Am I directing him to the goal or are you following him? Sure. Directing, okay. And then say a patient comes in crying. She's been fighting with the boyfriend all the time. She's like, oh my God, my boyfriend is so mad. Um, and so I, she comes in and I say, well, I can tell that you're not really happy with your current state of relationship. What kind of style is that? Am I directing or am I following her? Following her, yes. So, um, so, you kind of, so once you can identify both, you can decide, you can figure out what you're doing um, and how you want to change that. So patient motivation. It's very easy to recognize the motivation once the goal is accomplished. So for instance, in your, when you take your step two, if you did great on your step two, it's pretty easy to infer that you were pretty motivated to study, right? Because uh, the, the goal is already there. We've seen the results, but we can tell that you were motivated. Uh, however, sometimes the thing is, how do we recognize a patient's motivation before the goal is accomplished? Because what we want to do is get that goal accomplished. Right? So how do we recognize their motivation? Um, for instance, a patient who, so, so we talk about eating healthy. If, they stop, if, if a patient tells us, oh man, I went to the grocery store and I bought all these groceries, we can tell they're kind of motivated, right? Versus the patient who just goes to McDonald's going to the grocery store, buying healthy stuff. You know, it takes a little bit of work so we can tell that they're kind of motivated. Um, so how do we know what, what their motivation is? We have to listen to what's being said. Instead of us doing the talking, listen to what they're saying. And based on what they're saying, you can tell are they moving towards a, a motivation or are they moving away from the motivation. So what and how uh, the patients are saying. So let's look at this chart. The first line says, I don't like testing my blood sugars. If that's what we're hearing, or if they hear, I kind of like testing my blood sugars because I feel like I'm a doctor and stuff, and it's fun to use the meter. So the shaded parts are all uh, things patients say if they're moving towards a motivation, or if they're moving towards motivational change. This side, the unshaded, the negative side, is all stuff we hear if, if patients are kind of going away from the motivation or motivational change. So uh, what we li like to look at this is sustained talk and change talk, positive change. Negative sustain, they're kind of just going to sustain their behavior and sustain what they're already doing. So if we tell a patient to eat something healthy, he says, ah, I don't think I need to eat more vegetables. He's probably going to sustain talking. He's not really motivated to eat vegetables. But if he says, I know I, know I should eat more vegetables, which a lot of our patients say, they're just not there yet. At least they're, they're, they're giving the right kind of uh, language. They're giving you the right body language. They're saying the change talk. Uh, think about uh, going to sleep. I know if I go to bed, or, if I go to bed earlier, I won't have any time to relax, so I don't want to I don't want to do that. Or if, they say, or if the kids are having sleeping problems, if mom's like, well, I know if they go to bed earlier, they would have more patience. They'd be better during the day. So positive change talk, all right? Um, and the last one, smoking. I think I need to quit smoking sometime soon. That's a good positive change. Any patient comes in saying that, you know, they're like, oh, I think I need to quit smoking, 
they're, they're giving you the signals that they're motive, they have some motivation to change. But some patients are like, oh, doc, I'm not ready to quit smoking. I leave it because they're, they're in the sustained, they're, they're not ready, to, they're not, there's no motivation from them to change. I can't make them change. Um, the same chart can be looked at with like different aspects of motivation. The, the blood sugar thing shows that when they say things like, oh, I kind of like it, this, they're showing a desire, desire to change. If they talk about, like Deepu said, it would be possible for me to go to the gym and talk about the ability to change. Uh, when they talk about, like, uh, I need to eat more vegetables, talk about the need to change. Uh, if they understand the reason to change, and then when if somebody says, I'm going to quit smoking on Monday, they're showing a commitment to change. So you can think about this, the same things, you can think about different aspects of, of, of motivation. So what are the, what are the language indicators? What are they, I want, I don't want, I wish, I would like, I hate, I enjoy. It talks about the desire to change. Um, their ability, so I can, I can't, I am able, I'm not able, I'm unable, I couldn't, I cannot. Talks about their uh, ability to change. Um, other language indicators, the need, so I need to, I ought to, which a lot of our patients say, I know I need to do this, I should do this, um, I shouldn't have done that, I shouldn't have eaten that stuff over Christmas, uh, I have to do this, I better. So that talks about their, their need to change, so they understand that they need to change. The reason, so sometimes like so, or because, or I don't need to. They're making reasons and excuses. And then the commitment. This is the hard part. So I'll try. This is where we want to get patients, to get them to that commitment of motivation and change. I'll try. I might. I definitely will. I won't. I promise. Don't ever promise patients anything. Um, I suppose. And if they say, I will, you know, I will do this. Whether they do it or not, at least they have that motivation. Um, so, uh, all right. So back to this chart. So just remember, what we want to do is if we're hearing this stuff, we want to get them to say this stuff. Okay? We, want to, we want to evoke this stuff from them. Just think about change talk. So how do we get change talk? So what we, this goes to motivation and practice, what me and Deepu did. Uh, so how do we get them to, how do we get them to the desire to change? So we ask them stuff. Hey, going to the gym, what might you enjoy about going to the gym? Ask them what they enjoy about what we're asking them to do. The ability to change. Get them to understand. What, cause really what we want to do is we want to walk them through this journey of, uh, of the different emotions. And then, it, then that will inspire their commitment. So, Get the desire out of them. Then we want to talk about the ability. You know, we, don't, we just tell them to go do something. What's the practicality of somebody going to, get in, going to the gym? Do they have, they have, can they afford a gym membership? You know, a lot of our patients, we tell them, hey, go to the track. You know, go walk around. What, what's the nearest park around you? So if you decided to go to the gym, how could you do it? Or if you wanted to work out, how could you, how could you, how could you do it? Walk them through that. Walk them through that journey. Next, get them to state, uh, get them to state the need, understand the need for the change versus you just telling them they need to do it, get them to understand why they need to do it. So how important is it to you? If it, and if it's not important, it's not important. But um, you get a good grasp of how important it is to them. Because we know it's important to us. Like, if I want to tell patients stop smoking, it's important to me. But is it really important to them? Uh, let you gives you a good indicator if it's going to happen or not. And then the reasons. Get them to walk through the reasons. What, if any, are there important benefits you see? And then the steps. For instance, if people are already doing stuff, you know, what are you already doing? Get them to recognize it's almost like a form of uh, patting themselves on the back. Get them to recognize what they're already doing. It's positive reinforcement, like, versus us just being, oh, you're not doing this, this, and this. Well, let's figure out what you are doing. Um, let's focus on that. So talk, get them, get, and all this stuff is get them to say. You don't say it, but get the patient to say it. So now the science stuff. What does the research show? So motivational living started back in the early 80s. Um, in 1993 was the first time they did a clinical trial on it. Uh, it started with actually with alcohol abstinence. It started in uh, inpatient treatment centers, and I think it was like a, they did like a 14-day uh, Alcoholics Anonymous thing, and the patients who were uh, motivationally interviewed were drank three times. It was like three times less likely to drink uh, to recur, like fall off the wagon than the people who didn't have any motivation interviewing because you're evoking the emotions in the patient. So uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but so this just shows the number of publications about motivational interviewing, um, showing that it works. So in 83, there was maybe one study. By 20, 2011, there was 200 studies. There was like 500 studies or something on it um, since then. Uh, so this shows the potential for motivational interviewing to improve outcomes and management of diabetes and obesity in pediatric and adult populations. Um, our teenagers, our, and our teenagers and our, and our young adults, are really the ones we really need to think about. Uh, try to get them to get their motivation. Um, and all these studies just show that there was statistical significance or um, uh, change in relative risk ratio. So motivation, motivational interviewing for smoking cessation. 
Uh, motivation interviewing, counseling for hypertension. Um, motivation interviewing to increase people with chronic diseases, physical activity with chronic diseases, and medication adherence. These last two, uh, this was done by occupational therapists. This was done by pharmacists. So it just shows that motivation interviewing can be done by anybody. It's not just the physician that has to do it. Everybody can be doing it. Everybody should be doing it. Um, so why does it work? Um, the main, one of the reasons why it works is because it's a patient-initiated motivation. It's not about us telling them what to do. Um, the patient gets to access. They get to nurture. They get to remind themselves. They get to focus. And we walk them through the desire, the ability, the need for the change. Um, when a patient talks, about, talks out loud about why it's enjoyable, um, they say that it actually goes along with later actually doing the, doing the behavior. When the patient talks about doing the behavior, it goes positively correlates with them actually doing the behavior versus us just talking about the behavior. Uh, there are several studies that show that. So uh, there are several studies that show that when, when you hear change talk, all those positive things on the right side of column, when you hear the change talk, there's a very good likelihood that you're going to see some results from it. Um, and as well, it's a patient-initiated motivation, uh, motivation, and then it's a supportive interaction. It creates a better bond between you and the patient. So it creates a good nurturing relation between the healthcare professional and the and the patient. So onto the journey. Now, is a, now how do we practically put it in? So we went through that stuff where you walk them through. The step stage one is going to be engaging the patient. So engage them in a mutually respectful relationship where a collaboration occurs uh, and consider goals. And so you can consider goals. So um, engaging the patient in a mutually like so really sitting down with them. Um, they said there's a, so the guy who he's like the grandfather of motivation, I mean, Steve Rolinick or something. He has a it's called a rule of twenty. So 20% so take say you have a 20-minute encounter. 20% of your encounters to so four minutes. The first four minutes should be spent just engaging the patient. Not getting on the computer, not logging in, not doing your physical exam. But the first 20, the first four minutes, so just 20% of your encounter should be just spent engaging the patient. Uh, sitting down with them, talking to them. That's kind of what I do. Like when I go into a room, I just sit down, and I'm like, hey, what's up? How's it going? How's Christmas? Um, engage your patient so they don't think of themselves as like a number or you know, the next chart. They think of themselves, oh, this guy really likes, you're really talking to me. He understands. And, uh, you'll find yourself, the more you engage a patient, the more results you're going to get. So try to think of the rule of 20. Engage your patient. Step two, focus. Uh, focusing involves uh, the healthcare provider and the client talking about possible directions uh, that the client uh, is considering. So when we're talking about different things about like going to the gym and weight loss. So uh, focus on what they are, things that they are considering. Uh, Stage three is evoking. This is the most important part. So instead of trying to uh, push, 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 try to pull from them. Pull from your patients. Instead of trying to push knowledge on them, push this study and push this guideline and push this medication, pull from them. See what they want. See what they want to get out of it and try to evoke. Try to evoke change from them. Um, and this is the hard part, planning. So the planning part is it's just part of the journey. And if, you're, if you get to the plan, you've done your job. Uh, but getting to the plan is the hard part. So don't focus on the plan. Focus on just getting to the plan. Uh, because once you've gotten to the plan, you've really done a good job. Uh, so what are some strategies? Some strategies. So change the one, one thing we can do is change the way we communicate. Um, and this is probably the most important thing you can take from this. So instead of explaining why he should do a health-promoting behavior, which is what we do. So when a patient says, when a patient has this, patient has a, when a patient's obese, all I do is I explain. Oh, you should do this because if you don't control or you don't control your diabetes, you're going to get kidney problems and you're going to end up on dialysis. And um, instead of t explaining to them what they should do, listen with the goal of understanding um, the patient's dilemma and ask them, you know, hey, ask them, what do you think will happen if you don't control your diabetes? What do you think is going to happen if you just let this stuff go out of control? Um, and, it's, so, and don't do this. Teaching the patient, telling the patient what to do, and just giving him advice. Ask him what he knows. Ask them what, um, what they understand about it. And then, and then fill in the gaps for them. Um, and, and ask them what the stuff that, the stuff that advice you're giving. Uh, we did go to school, so we learned a few things. So the stuff that we're giving them, you know, how does it fit in with their life? Like, what practically can you fit into your life with this? Uh, so change the way we communicate. Another thing, so importance and confidence scales. So for instance, I asked Deepu, hey, Deepu, how important is it you to get to the gym? He's like, not really. So, yeah, so it's not really important to him. So, uh, on a scale, so when you ask a patient on a scale of one to ten, how important is is uh, you losing weight? They're all going to say 
probably a six, probably a seven. Somewhere, a lot of them are going to be like a ten. Like it's, it's, it's a ten, I want to lose weight. Um, on a scale of one to ten, how confident are you that you can lose some weight? Some of them might say, man, I'm not confident at all. Like, I really want it. It's important to me, but I'm not confident at all. If you're not hearing, if you're not hearing a number seven, walk away from it. Because whatever, the studies have shown that if, on a scale of one to ten, if, it's, if, if they say it's a seven or higher and how important it's to them, then there might be some change. If they say that seven or higher, that they're confident they can do it, there might be some change. Um, so look for that seven if you want to use these objective scales. Um, and then encourage the change talk, change talk, change talk. So go through, these, go, through these, uh, go through this journey. What might you enjoy about it? If you decided to do it, how would you do it? How important is it to you? you know, what, are the benefits of you what are the benefits you think are of doing it? And then uh, what are you already doing? Positive reinforcement for stuff they're already doing. That's, like the, that's a really good thing, way to pat them on the back. And then try to steer away from the words like non-compliant. Um, I know we don't say it to our patients, but don't even refer to them. Take that negative energy out of it. Um, if they're not compliant, they're not compliant, whatever. But um, instead of focusing on how non-compliant they are, think about the things that they are doing right. Um, and try to get that out of your head, uh, the non-compliant thing. So, and then how do we piece it all together? So we, I've identified their barriers. We've gotten their motivation. Now we've got to bridge their barriers, right? So um, for their, the time barrier, break their day down for them. Uh, you know, sit down with them, ask them, spend an extra five minutes, ask them, what's your day like? And then piece in where all these meds you're telling them to do and this exercise you're telling them to do and, um, all the stuff we're asking them to do, piece it in together, and, and like ask them what their day is like. And if it sounds crazy, change it. You know, just take some stuff away. Like focus on stuff that you know that they're going to do. But don't ask them to take 20 different meds. Like one med's TID, one med's BID, one med's got to be at 6 a.m. in the morning. If it doesn't sound practical, back off from it and give them something that's practical. So look at their day, talk about their day with them, and see if it's something practical. Like I said, if it sounds crazy, don't do it. Uh, money, the money barrier. So. If, for our kids, the money barrier is not a big thing. But for adults, the money barrier is a huge thing. Um, for most of my patients, uh, I'll ask, I'll first, first thing I do is check if they have insurance whenever, before I walk in the room. Um, if they don't have insurance, uh, I'll let you see if they're free care. If they don't have free care, I ask them if they've signed up for free care. Uh, and if they haven't signed up for free and if they haven't signed up for free care, even if they have free care, that covers everything inpatient. That doesn't cover everything outpatient. Um, I ask them what they can afford. I ask them practically. When I walk, before we start the encounter, you know, we talk about the meds. Before I start writing prescriptions, I ask them, what can you really afford? How much can you afford? How much money are you willing to spend for a month? Because there's no point in me giving you Lantis for 20 bucks. Lantis, if they can't afford it, you know, on the market, Lantis is it's like $100, $300 or something. It's super expensive. Um, I, look, I, I myself know what's on the $4 list pretty good. Um, so I ask them what they can afford, and we try to piece together a $4 prescription consolidated list, and I print them coupons. Um, GoodRx.com is something that pharmacists hate, but uh, but physicians love. So um, I print coupons for almost all my patients, you know, especially some of the, like some of the creams and stuff that for the, uh, the none of the dermatologist stuff covers. Um, I print coupons for them. So just ask them what they can afford. Bridge that money barrier that you have with patients. Um, and then the family barrier. Find out who all they're taking care of and who's all taking care of them. You know, find out how many kids, even some of our teenagers. Some of our teenagers are taking care of all their younger siblings. So I find out from our kids, like, hey, how many kids are you, who are you, who are you taking care of and who's taking care of you? Um, try to really understand their home setting and what we're, what we're demanding from them. Um, and then the education, bridge the literacy gap. Uh, ask them if they truly understand uh, some, of the words, some of the words you're using. Ask them if they, can, if they can get them to read the bottles to you, get them to read what says twice a day, what says three times a day, what says daily. Um, and then ask them about the physical side effects. Explain that you understand the physical side effects. Hey, I know this causes nausea, I know this causes metformin, causes diarrhea to some people. Uh, but are you still willing to take it? Or if it causes a little bit of discomfort, are you willing to take half the dose? Um, I know you have to do four needle pricks every day. Um, how's that going? You know, ex let, let the patient know that you understand what you're, um, you're trying to understand at least what, what you're asking. So bridge those, bridge all the different barriers. Um, and then this goes back to our, our beginning learning objective. So how do we really make an impact? So objective one, identify the patient's personal barriers. Um, all those social barriers, identify them. Two, use our motivational interview techniques to evoke that change talk. Just think about the change talk. Instead of just telling them what to do, just ask them stuff um, and try to get them to talk about that change. And then bridge those barriers so we can come up with a practical, impactful plan so that when the patient counters over, you feel like there's going to be some real change when they go back. And the next time they come to see you, they come back, they're excited because they've actually made some change. They want to, it's like the kid who goes, uh, comes home and he's got, a, he's got an A on his, on his test and wants you to put it on the fridge. Uh, 
probably the most satisfaction you can get as a, as a healthcare provider when the patient comes back and they've, they've shown so much change that they're proud and they want to show you what, what they've done. Um, and that's pretty much it. We'll wrap it up and end. Questions, comments? Yes, sir. What you got? Hi, Tommy. That's a fantastic talk. Thank you. Great, great area. This is something that the uh, Academy of Pediatrics is working on. We actually have a grant application in to, to bring in some speakers across the state Solid. for pediatricians on motivational interviewing because of its, its strong impact. And as you said, especially in the teenagers. Yeah. I had a great uh, experience in my clinic yesterday that I'll, I'll share with you. I have a 16-year-old girl who was a uh, runaway at when she was in eighth grade, she spent two years on the streets. She had HIV. She was uh, prostituting to make money. She really had been through hell. And um, I've been taking care of her for about a year. Uh, her viral load is undetectable. And um, yesterday, when she, I saw her in September, and I was dreading it. I was just like, uh, I can't. I'm just not looking forward to seeing it. I want to transition her here to somebody else. I'm just kind of dreading it. And, and I went in to see her, and she looked fantastic. You know, she was in a new group home and in a, in a fertile environment where she could really thrive. And it really just made my day uh, when I saw her in September. And when I saw her yesterday, it was, it was really more the same. And it was, um, she was in such a positive environment. And I was able to, to give get back to her the feedback of really how proud I was of her, that despite all the stuff that she'd been through, and she's still going through a lot, working through things, that she could, you know, be focused on getting her GED and, and glad to be in Job Corps and that her bar load's undetectable. And she said, I'm undetectable, that's great. You know, she could recognize it. So the, where I was really interested in, in motivational interviewing was she had, had to go to court um, and in New Orleans, where she's from, and you know, now she's up here. Uh, but she had to go back sort of into the, to the bad area where all the bad things happened. And she says that she went down to the weekend before and uh, had to stay with a foster family that she didn't know. And she, she said that she got, she started having more hallucinations and hearing voices and, and couldn't sleep at night. And so we spent some time kind of exploring why, you know, why do you think you weren't able to, to sleep that weekend and, and those things came up? And, and she says, I don't know. She said, I was taking my medicine. I just, I don't know. I don't know. And so then was, I suggested, well, do you think it was related to you were worried about going to court? And it was just like a light switch came on. You know, that just that little exploration. And she was like, well, yeah, probably so. Because after it was over with, I felt so relieved. You know, and, and everything was done, and everything happened the way it was supposed to, and that kind of thing. And she'd been practicing what she was going to say to the judge to make sure she didn't, you know, have any questions. And so, it, it, for me, it just felt like one of those things where it was, it was that I could help her get a little insight into what was going on with her, help her recognize some of the signs of that, because she reported other times when she gets anxious or nervous, and then come up with some solutions of things that she could try, and. You know, like I said, it's just telling, being able to tell her how proud I was of her and her success came back, you know, again and again to really motivate me to do better. Um, so I think this goes both ways. Yeah. When we see those impacts, they positively reinforce the things we do and help us do better as physicians. No, no. <laughs> you have questions, comments? Yes. Yeah. Um, I know in the nursery, Things we think about, especially when we have smaller babies or preemie babies and stuff, in terms of when to discharge. And if I've got a mother who's got other children at home, one year old, two year old, three year old, whatever, and I've got a baby who's going to need to be fed every three hours and stuff, that's all, that kind of stuff is always in the back of my mind about how realistically do I think this is going to happen? Maybe I need to hold this baby here a little bit longer. So it really is important to get that social history and find out what's going on at home. Also, another thing in terms of how eloquently you went through time, for a lot of our patients, 
their um, their their schedules are skewed, maybe six hours different from ours. They may be sleeping late in the morning and going to bed, you know, in the early hours of the morning and stuff. So when you're talking about getting something, you know, three times a day, you may need to explore when are they getting up, when are they going to bed, and when are they eating meals and stuff, and try to figure out tailored tailor the times they need to take medicines to the times that they're actually living. And transportation is a big issue for many of our patients. And here you have a mom who's driving who has a car. A lot of our patients don't necessarily, or they may be one car that the whole family is using, and so they don't have ready access to it. You talk about a grocery store. It's easy for you and for me to go to the grocery store, fill up our trunk with uh, bags of, of groceries and stuff and take it home, but what about the mother who doesn't have a car and who's got a couple of little ones at home and nobody to babysit while she goes to the grocery store and how is she going, you know, she may have to take the bus to get there and how is she going to get all her groceries home and she may only be able to carry a couple of sacks worth instead of a trunk full of stuff. So, so lots, 15 bucks in the well, and that's exactly right. So lots of different things to think about that we don't even realize that's not even on our radar because we the, our lives aren't like that. And it, and it really is important to become aware of, of, of the struggles that our families deal with day to day and that make it hard uh, to, to follow, to to comply. And I, uh, I'm so glad you brought up the not comply because I hate to see it in the record too because there's always something behind that. Um, you need to find out what's going on while they're not why they haven't been taking the medicines or whatever it is that you've recommended. But, but it, it can be difficult. We, we make assumptions that their lives are like ours when most of the time they're not. And you are close to ours. So. One of the things I do with the patients I have on chronic medications, like my HIV patients, is to ask about how many times did they miss their medicine in the, in the past month and give them an opening to be honest about didn't think about it how many times and, and then we use, use some of these techniques to explore what is it about those times when they miss their medicines that and for teenagers it's often well with the weekend I wasn't on a school schedule summertime is notorious that everything goes haywire and so this again the same type of techniques can be applied to just something as specific as uh, a chronic medication and keeping up with it and, and reinforcing the importance of it for HIV it's easy because you know, I can, I can be honest that they have to have 95% compliance. For most kids, that means one dose a month that they can miss, and I won't fuss at them. But uh, the techniques apply very nicely to the This was really nice presentation. Thank you. And I try to use uh, some of these techniques in my daily clinical, clinical encounters too. Uh, sometimes what I would do is by the end of the visit, I would say, for example, a patient with type 1 diabetes, I would say, okay, would you like to come up with a couple of things you want to work on, you want to change, can you, do you want to set a couple of goals? And they would actually list things. And also, as you know, we also <coughs> take care of children with overweight or obesity problems. And American Academy of Pediatrics uh, is a very nice uh, app. There's an app for everything, and there's an app for that too. It's called Change Talk, and it's about motivational interviewing uh, in approach to overweight and obese children. And uh, it has also small uh, clips that, you know, that there are some 12 minute uh, short clips that you could go actually watch and see. Uh, it, it's very informational, so you could. Uh, you may want to take a look at that, but thank you. This was uh, I didn't see you know it. change talk. Yeah, that's the. I think this has been a great presentation and a really good discussion. But I, I think sometimes it's very easy to make a diagnosis for a patient, but the real issue is making sure that that patient who has a chronic illness that you just diagnosed makes the changes that are necessary to improve their lives or to. Uh, minimize the complications that might be associated with us with that chronic illness, diabetes, heart disease, thyroid problems. Uh, you, you can name any any disorder that takes a lot of work to keep it in order. And so having a therapeutic relationship with the patient is a key to you being a successful physician. And this is a really nice approach. Pay attention to the patient. 
think about the patient's life and what's different about the patient's life and what you need to understand to make sure that that patient can do what you want them to do. And using this motivational technique is a really good way to help you make sure that the patient's engaged, paying attention, you're paying attention to the patient so that you understand that to get the best outcome for your patient. So thank you, it's very nice for Thank you. Rip. Other comments? I just have one more comment. Do those work with getting your residents to study and do their duty hours? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, only those have tried. <laughs> you're going to be reading through, you're going to see through everything you're about to do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, guys. Get out there and make